Good afternoon, Mel Mariah, and those who are watching on Bible study today. Uh, we welcome you to the sanctuary of Mel Mariah Baptist Church for our Bible study, and we are continuing our conversation from the Psalms, and today uh, we want to take a look at Psalm 144. Psalm 144, we're asking that you will please uh, pull out your tablets, your cell phones, your Bibles, or whatever method you may have for the reading of God's Word. From the New International Version, Psalm 144 reads this way, Praise be to the Lord my rock who trains my hands for war, my fingers for battle. He is my loving God and my fortress, my stronghold and my deliverer, my shield in whom I take refuge, who subdues people under me. Lord, what are human beings that you care for them, the immortals that you think of them? They are like a breath, their days are like a fleeting shadow. Part your heavens, Lord, and come down. Touch the mountains so that they smoke. Send forth lightning and scatter the enemy. Shoot your arrows and rout them. Reach down your hand from on high. Deliver me and rescue me from the mighty waters, from the hands of foreigners whose mouths are full of lies, whose right hands are deceitful. I will sing a new song to you, my God. On the ten-string lyre, I will make music to you, to the one who gives victory to kings, who delivers his servant David. From the deadly sword, deliver me, rescue me from the hands of foreigners, whose mouths are full of lies, whose right hands are deceitful. Then our sons in their youth will be like well-nurtured plants, and our daughters will be like pillars carved to adorn a palace. Our barns will be filled with every kind of provision. Our sheep will increase by thousands, by tens of thousands in our fields. Our oxen will draw heavy loads. There will be no breach in the walls, no going into captivity, no cry of distress in our streets. Blessed is the people of whom this is true, Blessed is the people whose God is the Lord. Amen. Let us pray. Father, we thank you and we praise you for this opportunity to come to study your word on today. For your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. We ask and pray that you would bless us as we study together and that you would be the ultimate teacher. In the name of the Christ, we pray and give thanks. Amen. Well, on the title, Psalm 144, happy are those whose God is the Lord. Happy are those whose God, capital G, is the Lord, capital L. Psalm 144 is a very interesting psalm. You see in the subscript that it is said to be a psalm of David. It is thought to be a royal psalm. That may have been first used by King David when he was anointed king of Israel. Uh, but it probably was one that was also used in further coronations of kings during the history of Israel. Uh, some say that it really does not fit as a royal psalm. Some say that it is a rereading of Psalm 18 or a reinterpretation of Psalm 18, or the psalmist reads Psalm 18, and then he gets excited about it, and he begins to quote some words to describe how he feels, and that becomes the 144th Psalm. The reason why scholars say that it is a rereading of Psalm 18, but because of the language uh, that comprises both psalms. For example, aliens are mentioned in verses 7 and 11. And then we see these aliens uh, being problems to Israel and God dealing with these aliens or these foreigners on behalf of the king. So again, it is thought, and I like this notion, uh, that when the psalmist looked at read Psalm 18, he found something in it that 
prompted him to write Psalm 144. There must have been some type of promise from Psalm 18 that resonated with his soul that fits him and therefore he gives a, a new version of Psalm 18. He, he prays or he reprays uh, Psalm 18 and therefore we have before us Psalm 144. Another reason why we think that this might be a, a re-prayer or uh, a rewriting or something that inspired him from Psalm 118 to write Psalm 144 uh, because he basically, the psalmist does, appeals to the Lord to do for the people of his time what the Lord had in fact did for David. So we do know that the monarchy of David is no longer and therefore the promises that God made to the monarchy are now transferred to the people. And so uh, we believe again that it is a re-prayer of Psalm 18. And so the monarchy has failed and therefore the people come to the realization in Psalm 144 that their true and ultimate hope lie in the sovereignty of God. So in the Psalms we have heard a lot about trusting God, a lot about putting hope in God. We've heard a lot about the sovereignty of God. The word sovereignty is a major term in the book of Psalms. Uh, I've said it time and time again. Sovereignty means that God is in control that God rules, that God reigns. So when we look at verse 15, uh, B of Psalm 144, it asserts that God is sovereign over everything, that God reigns over people and God rules all the world. In light of Psalm 18, we see that whole notion of the sovereignty of God in Psalm 18 and we see it again in Psalm 144. So again, the psalmist recalls what happens in Psalm 18 and writes Psalm 144. Even we see this whole notion of the transience of humanity, the brevity of humanity, and this transience of humanity and this brevity of humanity being sort of a prelude uh, to an appeal for God's help. So uh, we see uh, verses 3 and 4 uh, followed by petitions of verses 5 through 8, and we will talk about that in, in a few moments. As I thought about this whole notion of the psalmist recalling what happened in Psalm 18 and then writing Psalm 144, I think about how we might read a scripture and then from that scripture, uh, we expound on that scripture. Or when we take a promise of God and that promise of God resonates within our soul. And then we get a, give an explanation uh, of what that particular verse means to us. That's, that's sort of what the psalmist is doing in relationship to Psalm 18 and in relationship to Psalm 144. Or... I thought about myself as being a pastor and preaching through the book of Lamentations and then taking Lamentations 3, for example, uh, God's mercies are new every morning, great is thy faithfulness, and then that scripture resonating with me and therefore expanding or expounding upon that scripture in a sermon in which I write down. That's sort of what the psalm is that's what the psalmist has done. But Psalm 44 has lasted thousands and thousands of years. But again, it recalls what happened in Psalm 18. So the first section is verses 1 through 11. And um, we will at least get to verses 1 through 11 on today. And then uh, the second section is uh, basically... Uh, verses 11 uh, through through 15. And so we might not get that far 
on today, but we'll definitely get through verses 1 through 11. So verses 1 through 11 comprise uh, the first section. The uh, first section is a section on praise, verses 1 and 2, uh, which reads, Praise be to the rock, my Lord, who trains my hands for war, my fingers for battle. He is my loving God and my fortress, my stronghold and my deliverer, my shield in whom I take refuge, who subdues peoples under me. And then we see in verses 3 and 4, uh, this whole notion of, of reflection. Lord, what are human beings that you care for them? Mere mortals that you think of them. They are like a breath. Their days are like a fleeting shadow. That's verses 3 and 4. And then we have a petition. He's asking God uh, to do something in verses 5 through 8. Part your heavens, Lord, and come down. Touch the mountains so that they smoke. Send forth lightning and scatter the enemy. Shoot your arrows and rout them. Reach down your hand from on high. Deliver me and rescue me from the mighty waters, from the hands of foreigners whose mouths are full of lies, whose right hands are deceitful. I will sing a new song to you, my God. On the ten-string lyre, I will make music to you. And then uh, we have uh, further praise and uh, petition in verses nine and nine and ten. Uh, I made verse nine a part of that petition um, in verses five through eight, uh, but it is further praise and petition in verses nine and ten. I will sing a new song to you, my God, on the ten string lyre. I will make music to you, to the one who gives victory to kings who delivers his servant David from the deadly sword, deliver me. So um, that is how it is, it is broken down. And then the second section, uh, verses 11 uh, through 15, uh, it is said to be a, an imaginary Davidic descendant who is, who is talking. So let's, let's look at this. Let's look at this. Uh, remember that verses 1 and 2 are giving praise to God. Let me read it uh, again. There is a lot in verses 1 and 2. Praise be to the Lord my rock, who trains my hands for war, my fingers for battle. He is my loving God and my fortress, my stronghold and my deliverer my shield in whom I take refuge, who subdues people under me. So here we have the psalmist giving praise. The psalmist is thanking God for the strength to wage war against his enemies. Again, initially this may have been King David, uh, but after probably all the kings who were a part of the monarchy probably use Psalm 144, uh, but now that there is no longer a monarchy, uh, the people resonate with this. The psalmist is thanking God for strength to wage war against his enemies. And so how does the psalmist prepare for war? He prepares for war by training his hands and by planning his strategy. And because of that, he says in verse 1 uh, that the Lord is his God. And he praises the Lord to be his rock who trains his hands for war and his fingers for, for battle. So he sees God as this sort of benefactor of loving kindness. God is the one who shows loving kindness towards him by giving him the strength to wage war against his enemies. 
but also know, notice some other things or some other words or some figurative language to express his trust in God or to express what trust in God looks like. This, look at these figurative words. He is my loving God and my fortress, my stronghold and my deliverer, my shield in whom I take refuge, who subdues people under me. So he says that God gives him the strength to go into battle. God does that because God loves me. And because God loves me, I'm going to put my trust in God. And these are some words that I can use to reiterate the trust in God that I have. He's my God. He's my fortress. He's my stronghold. He's my deliverer. He's my shield. He's my refuge. He subdues people under me. So God is his fortress. God is his high tower. The psalmist again puts his trust in God. It's like God places him in a high tower to keep him safe from his enemies. God is his high tower, which is more than a fortified site within his fortress. So God is his fortress, but not only that, but God is his high tower. God is for him a fortified site that is much higher than his fortress. God is his rescuer. God is his salvation. God is his shield in battle. God is his refuge. God subdues the people under him, which means that God weakens the nations under, under him. That sounds like good news to me. I know that there are times in which we face the challenges of life, and I'm sure as we use these words that express our trust in God, we begin to think about those situations in which we had to do just that, to place our trust in God. There was some type of battle um, that we were facing in our lives. It may have been a mental, physical, or spiritual battle. And therefore, uh, we had to go to our rock. Our rock strengthens us or strengthens us for that battle. And, and out of that, we realize that God is our fortress, that God is our high tower, that God is our stronghold, our deliverer, our shield, that God is our rescuer, that God is our refuge, that God loves us so much that God is able to put our enemies under our feet. And so God is the one uh, that we need to go to in time of battle. Notice again, or let me say it again, God is the one to whom we go to in times of battle. And as we shall see in a few moments, we will see how the psalmist fights this battle. But again, we talk about it all the time. The battle is not ours, it's the Lord's. That's so true. And, and I would admit first and be honest that so many times it is not easy getting out of the way to let the Lord fight our battles. Um, but if we do allow the Lord to fight our battles, we will come out victorious every time. And we will see the psalmist coming out victorious. So in verses 3 and 4, we see what we call a reflection. We've heard these scriptures before, verses 3 and 4. Lord, what are human beings that you care for them? Mere mortals that you think of them. They are like a breath. Their days are like a fleeting shadow. So this, this is a reflection. The psalmist reflects about what God has done. After all he says in verses 1 and 2, after all he declares, 
he realizes that he is not deserving of God's love. He's not deserving of God's loving kindness, God's steadfast love. And so therefore he asks God, what, what is man's work that you take notice of him and act kind towards her? What is man's work, God, that you notice man? What is woman's work that you act towards her with loving kindness? And he also, again, realizes that he is not deserving of the loving kindness of God. So he reflects and says, who is God that God thinks of me and does so many good things for me? Who am I that God thinks of me and does so many good things for me? So the psalmist is is thinking about himself or he may be thinking about humanity in general or maybe a combination of both, but he is undoubtedly amazed at God's supervision over him. He says, who am I? Who is humanity? Humanity has been rebellious. Humanity has been sinful, but yet and still God loves humanity so much that God shows steadfast love, that God decides to be rescuer and deliverer. But the psalmist says, who am I? That God will take notice of me, that God will act kindly towards me, that God will do good things for me. So he believes that humanity and even himself are hardly worthy of God's mentioning. He sees humanity as nothing in comparison to God. And maybe we need to reflect that way sometimes. Who am I that God decides to be so good to me, to do so many good things for me? Who am I? What have I done? Uh, that God always is loving towards me. We're not deserving of it, but God does it in a way. And so every so often we need to reflect upon the love of God as well as God being our sustainer in everything that we may need. And then he explains uh, what humanity actually looks like. Verse 4, they are like a breath, their days are like a fleeting shadow. And so he says humanity is like a vapor that comes from or escapes from a pot. It comes and goes, right? The vapor comes from the pot. The vapor escapes from the pot that is brief. And he says that man's lifespan is brief. His days are like a shadow of a bird flying in the air. Bird flying in the air, the bird keeps going. The shadow is only for a second. So in comparison to... God being infinite, the days of our lives upon this earth are brief. But the days upon this earth that are brief, God shows unequivocally that God loves us. God is always kind towards us, even though we do not deserve it. So we need, we need to reflect upon that uh, every now and then. In verses 5 through 8, we see another petition. It reads, Part your heavens, Lord, and come down, touch the mountains so that they smoke, send forth lightning and scatter the enemy, shoot your arrows and rout them, reach down your hand from on high, deliver me and rescue me from the mighty waters, from the hands of foreigners, 
whose mouths are full of lies, whose right hands are deceitful. So the psalmist prays that God will help him in the future as God has done in the past. So for the psalmist, or let's say for the king, God had helped him in the past to be victorious in war. And now he's asking God to help him in the present war, for God to help him in the future war. So he thanks God for the past, and he asks God for help in the future. So he asks God for what we call divine help. He says, come down quickly, Lord, to help me to battle my enemies. And basically what he's saying is he's saying, Lord, touch my enemies so that they will be instantly defeated. We see that in verse 5. Part your heavens, Lord, and come down. Touch the mountains so that they smoke. And then, that's the petition. But then he continues that by asking God to use the weapons of God's warfare. Send forth lightning and scatter the enemy. Shoot your arrows and rout them. Reach down your hand from on high. Notice again the weapons that are being used. The psalmist is not using his own weaponry. He's using the weapons of God. Lightning to scatter the enemy. Arrows. Shoot your arrows and rout them. Reach down your hand from on high. Deliver me and rescue me. He's asking the Lord to use the Lord's own weapons to scatter the enemy and to give him victory. Deliver me and rescue me. Is what he asked the Lord to do. So again, he's asking the Lord for divine supervision. Again, these are not his weapons he's asking for. He's asking for God's weapons. So again, verse 7, reach down your hand from on high. Deliver me and rescue me from the mighty waters, from the hands of foreigners, whose mouths are full of lies, whose right hands are deceitful. He's asking the Lord to save him from the hand of strangers. And this is very interesting because when I looked at the Jewish Midrash, it gave a very interesting explanation of verse 7. He says, save him from the hands of strangers. It could be, or to save him from the hands of foreigners. according to the New International Version. So this could mean two things according to the Jewish Midrash. Either it could be uh, literally save him from the hands of foreigners who are trying to engage him in battle, who are trying to defeat him. Or it could be save him from those who openly express their love for him but hated him in their heart. So it could be the stranger or the foreigner could be the one who actually is trying to defeat Israel. Or it could be the person right beside him who every day expresses their love for him, but in their hearts they hate him. And he's asking God to save him from probably both. So the reality of it is, is that he's asking God to use God's weapons to defeat his enemies. But it could be that the psalmist understands that his enemies are those who are physically trying to pursue him. Or it could be those who are right by his side, who say they are by his side, but yet in their hearts they have turned against him. And so, you know, we have the same thing. We have enemies who are pursuing us outside of our camp and then we have those right under our noses who for some reason or another who turn against us, who become envious of us, um, who 
express that they love us, that they're in our corner, uh, but then they do something totally different. And so those are the wars that even we as Christians today face. So it is not necessarily those who fight a physical fight against him. It, it, it might be those, again, who are right by his side. So his enemies, they also lie against him. Uh, their words are full of lies. Their words are false. So what they do is that they, they say one thing to him and they do another. They swear to him that they're going to do one thing and then they do another. So in light of verse 8, his enemies are twofold. His enemies are those who are right by his side and those who physically fight against him. And so we have to thank God for protecting us from both because both are a reality. Verses 9 and 10, this further praise and, and petition, I think that this is a good place uh, to stop verses 9 and 10, this further praise and, and petition. Uh, verses 9 and 10, read, I will sing a new song to you, my God, on the ten-string lyre. I will make music to you, to the one who gives victory to kings, who delivers his servant David. And so we see further praise. We see a request uh, for divine appearance and new deliverance. And as a result of this deliverance, he already says what he's going to do. He's going to sing a new song. He has this ten-string lyre that he will make music to God. He will give God a new song. Why? Because God has delivered him and God has given him as king victory. It's, it's more than just him singing a song too. Yes, God has delivered him and a new song is in order. But through this new song, he will make God known. He will make God known to the nations. So his song will be a song about the supervision of God about God delivering him, about God rescuing him. And we, we see the words of the song in verse 10. The words of the song in, in verse 10, uh, where he says, to the one who gives victory to kings, who delivers his servant David. And so... This, these are the words of the song. So the Lord grants deliverance to the kings. The Lord rescues his servant David from evil. And so even though this song probably was written uh, post-exilic or after exile, we see that the community has not given up on the sovereignty of God. Despite there being at times dominance of those who are their enemies, they never give up on the sovereignty of God. They continue to trust God no matter how bad their situation is. So they assert the sovereignty of God and they trust God in every circumstance. And they even trust God when it appears as if God is not on their side. We see it in verse 11, from the deadly sword, deliver me, rescue me from the hands of foreigners whose mouths are full of lies, whose right hands are deceitful. So again, they praise God for delivering them, even though uh, there have been times in which it appears that the enemy just was so dominant that they would not be able to get out of what they're in. But they trust God to do so. And so for us, I think that that's so apropos too, because there, there are going to be times in which we 
our mental, physical, spiritual battles in which we wonder, how in the world am I going to get myself out of this mess? And we realize that as bad as the mess is, we cannot get ourselves out of it. We have to put our trust in a sovereign God and ask God to use God's weaponry to help us to defeat the enemies. Again, the enemy can be outside the camp. The enemy can be right inside the camp. There are going to be times in which we feel overwhelmed. But we must put our trust in a God who, who can rescue us, who will rescue us, who will deliver us, a God who is, who is our rock. Now, we know as, as the New Testament church, when we talk about the steadfast love of God, all we have to do is to go to John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that whosoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. God loves us so much that God sent his son to die for our sins. When Jesus died for our sins, you know, the old church talked about it. The old preachers talked about it. There was this battle going on in hell when Jesus was put in the tomb. He was, he was battling Satan. The old preachers, the old church used to say on Friday night and on Saturday, all day Saturday, he was fighting the devil and he came out victorious when he was resurrected. Well, the resurrection is a sign of victory. And that same resurrection that Jesus received uh, from that most humiliating death on the cross is the same resurrection that we have available to us today that helps us to come out victorious even in the midst of our battles with our enemies. So we don't have to fight. We don't have to use our weapons to fight. We trust God to fight for us. And we trust God to use God's weapons. And we trust God to help us to come out victorious. Amen. That's Psalm 144. Uh, we will finalize or finish the psalm next time. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you and we praise you for this opportunity to come and study your word. We praise you for being Lord and Savior of our lives and for giving us victory over the battles in our lives. In the name of the Christ, we pray and give thanks. Amen.